you. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and Dr. Gribbins, we're ready to call to order. Oh, thank you, uh, Sonia. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Good to see you all here this morning. Um, we uh, just as a, a way of introduction, I know many of you have been around the Valley Economic a, lot, a long time, but uh, it's always good to just uh, refresh on our, our mission, our focus, our charge, what we're what we're doing. And the Valley Economic Alliance is uh, uh, economic development partnership focused on the five cities in the San Fernando Valley, including uh, Burbank from Glendale to the east, Calabasas to the west, and uh, everything in San Fernando Valley in the city of Los Angeles uh, in between. <clears throat> and we, uh, it's a collaboration of uh, government, nonprofits, industry leaders. Uh, the Alliance pursues job creation and retention by offering free business advising, referrals to training and job opportunities by by uh, local campaigns, neighborhood revitalization programs, tourism, housing campaigns, and, and much more. Uh, this, the Education and Workforce Development Committee convenes uh, educational institutions and industry to help uh, develop strategies for building uh, and retaining regional talent. Uh, and that includes uh, helping job seekers upskill, qualify for higher wage occupations, and helping employers to create and fill jobs for qualified candidates. And I know uh, for me, it's just a delight to join you all this morning uh, as part of LA Valley College to help make sure that I'm staying connected with, uh, with industry and knowing what your needs are. So with that, uh, thank you. Uh, Sonia, do you wanna add some comments? Oh gosh, just to uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Barry Gribbins and Donna Frija for chairing our committee. And I, um, I uh, am very excited also to uh, join Donna and Barry in welcoming everyone. Uh, I've been on board with the Alliance for two years now, and it's been such a whirlwind. And it's such an important time, of course, for employers and job seekers alike. Uh, Long-term employment trends are all coming to a head given the disruptions um, in the labor market exacerbated by the pandemic. And we at the Valley Economic Alliance intend to be a strong advocate for furthering estab further establishing the San Fernando Valley region as a location of good paying jobs. And we're gonna need all of our insights as a community in order to solve problems and remove any obstacles to prosperous, equitable and environmentally sustainable development of our beloved San Fernando Valley region. So I'm super excited to welcome everyone uh, along with Barry and Donna and uh, uh, also encourage everyone, if you or someone you know needs uh, business assistance, uh, if you own a business or you know a business owner and uh, you're aware that there is a need for them to um, get help accessing capital, or uh, figuring out their marketing strategy or whatever, what have you, uh, then we have a free business assistance program. And I'm gonna put that information into the chat right now. And uh, with that, uh, Dr. Gribbins, if you completed your welcoming remarks, I think uh, we're ready for Donna to facilitate the self-introductions. But I give it back to you, Barry, in case you had anything else you wanted to say. No, thank you very much. And I should have introduced myself to the group. I'm Barry Gribbins, president of LA Valley College, and I'm thrilled to be the co-chair of this committee as well. And with that, let me turn it over to uh, Donna. Yeah, I'll just introduce myself. Thank you, Dr. Gribbins and Sonia. My name is Donna Ferrugia, and I'm on the west side in Calabasas. I'm uh, the president of a, a women-owned uh, staffing firm in Calabasas. Uh, the name of our firm is Equus, and I've, this is my first year uh, with the Alliance, and I'm so proud to be working with Sonia and Dr. Gribbins on the Education and Workforce Development Committee. So I look forward to working with all of you, and um, I'll turn it back over to you, Sonia. Okay, certainly. Well, let's go ahead and um, introduce ourselves to one another. We are a community. We are a network. It's very helpful if we know each other. I want to encourage all of you to put your contact information into the chat. If you'd like others on the call to be able to reach out to you, please put your video on if you'd like to uh, introduce yourself. And we'll do that very quickly so our presenter will know who's here in the Zoom room as he's doing his comments. Um, I'll begin with our board chair, uh, Fred Gaines. Good morning, Fred. 
Good morning, everyone. I'm Fred Gaines. I'm chairman of the board of the Valley Economic Alliance. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you to our committee uh, chairs for putting this program together. And uh, I'm an attorney with uh, the Law Office of Gaines and Stacey in Woodland Hills and uh, looking forward to the program. Thank you all. Thank you, Fred. Dr. Silbermanian, good morning. Thank you, Sonia. I'm Chandra Subramaniam. I'm the Dean for the David Nazarian College of Business and Economics at CSUN. So happy Thank to you. see you. <laughs> Forrest Hill. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Forrest Hill. Uh, great to see everybody here today. Um, I've been in the financial services industry for just over 30 years now, um, mostly in retail banking. And I recently switched jobs. So now I'm working for a consulting firm that does financial education for other institutions. So I'm really excited. This is really my passion. So what a perfect time for me to start a, a new role <laughs> with, you know, having been on this committee for, for two years now. So uh, great to see everybody again. Thanks, Forrest, and Forrest yep. is on our board. We're thrilled to that. Uh, Thank to you. Have yep. Board member, and also a Nancy Niebrook. Good morning, Nancy. Good morning. Uh, I'm a guest. I'm not actually on the committee, I don't believe. <laughs> I just like to register and hear what's going on and meet everybody. I'm the executive director of the Campbell Center. We're a nonprofit that supports adults with intellectual disabilities. Uh, specifically, and my interest in this group is uh, folks looking for work. We do employment support as well. Thank you. Welcome, Nancy and Victoria. My name is Victoria Doshogalian. I'm the Assistant Director of Government and Community Relations at CSUN. Um, I think this is my second meeting with you all, and I'll be celebrating my six months at CSUN on Monday. Congratulations. <laughs> Welcome. And Walter, hi there. Oh, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Oh, sorry, I'm Walter Zeisel. I'm the manager of education outreach and the corporate strategy and communications division at the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. I've been at Water and Power, September will be 45 years. I've been in education since 1987 and we've been in the education side of the house, we've been ramping up our uh, sort of um, career education side of things. Uh, and in fact, this Saturday we have this Lyman's Rodeo and we've been working in partnership with the LA Unified District to bring some students there because not only we have this competition with the linemen, line patrol mechanics, and but uh, we're gonna have some hands-on activities in science and we have several booths on careers. And so we're actively trying to recruit employees for, I mean, uh, community members and students in areas such as skill craft and in college grads in, um, in engineering. And of course we've, partnered with Cal State Northridge. We have a lot of graduates from Cal State Northridge and uh, we're interested in, like I said, in the community colleges, especially uh, programs and skill craft training and um, high schools to, we also been working with the CTE programs at LA Unified. Wonderful, Walter, welcome. Please put information about that in the chat if, we, if there are ways we can get involved. And good morning, Stephen, on our board. Welcome. Good morning, everyone, Stephen Contreras. Uh, 25 years in the financial services industry I'm here representing uh, Wells Fargo, uh, born and raised in the northern uh, northeastern part of the San Fernando Valley, actually went to CSUN myself. So uh, yeah, a little bit about me. Back to you, Sonia. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for your leadership on our board as well. I want to also acknowledge Kathy McIntyre, who has joined the call and is also on our board. Anyone who'd like to be introduced, go ahead and put on your video. In the meantime, Remy, hello. Hi everyone, um, my name is Remy Mraz. I'm the founder and CEO of Zella Life. And I was a small business grant recipient from the Valley Economic Alliance a few years ago. Um, at Zella Life, we're bridging the diversity gap in workforce development. Um, we develop talent, diverse talent at scale. And we also help companies execute their DEI goals and um, coach existing leaders on how to be better leaders to diverse talent. And so happy to be here and, and be a part Wonderful. of Wonderful. <laughs> so great to see you and see you doing yeah, well. Good to see you too, Sonia. <laughs> and Vaughn, good morning. Here, let's get you off mute, Vaughn. Vaughn, are you able to come off mute? 
Uh oh, we're still waiting for you to come off mute, Vaughn. Oh, I'm sorry, you know, I, I'm, I'm a guest as well and not part of the committee. This is the first uh, time attending uh, this meeting. I was in education for over about 30 years. I was a founder and president and CEO of Mount Sierra College for 21 years. Uh, uh, it was a bachelor's degree granting institution and a couple of thousand students and four or 5,000 uh, alumni. And it was acquired uh, six, six years ago. Uh, so currently I'm a regional president uh, in California for Cycle of Success Institute and uh, uh, over we have over 4,000 clients uh, and uh, helping the customers, coaching uh, the clients to uh, improve their performance. Wonderful. Great to meet you. Thanks for joining us. Thank and you. Fabiola, welcome. Hi, good morning, everyone. So it's my first time attending, very similar to Nancy. Um, I came across uh, the meetings through an email. I have partnered up with um, Valley College um, to be able to uh, partner up um, with some of the programs that Valley College offers. Um, I work for a DECO staffing, so we're a global staffing agency. Um, and we sit out of Glendale, but I cover everything in the San Fernando Valley and we do everything from um, upskilling to placements for light industrial all the way up to, um, you know, high level professional C level positions. So excited to be here and get to meet everybody over the next few meetings. Fantastic. Well, welcome everyone. And those of you who are not on video or calling on the phone, welcome to you as well. Um, would anyone else like to raise a hand or be introduced at this time? Okay, wonderful. Hearing uh, no um, takers there, we'll go ahead and move on with the rest of our agenda. Uh, now that we've completed self-introductions, I am thrilled to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Oh, and I see Jose, please, you raised your hand. Please introduce yourself. Let's get you off mute and then we'll be able to hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Great. I represent uh, the National Association of Financial and Insurance Agents and also the National Association of Health Insurance Underwriters in DC and California. We're the only institution that represents, well, there's two institutions here, so but we are the only institutions that represents constituents and agents on best interest in bills in DC and state. And I'm the government relations chair for the Los Angeles chapter and glad to be here. Oh, wonderful. We're so glad that you're here. We would like to, uh, you know, keep up on uh, legislative issues. We have many mayors and city council members involved with our organization. We have their ear and we um, love to work together as an alliance to uh, create our, our information and education for the community to understand what's happening legislatively. And so we will rely upon your expertise to help us uh, to get the word out about what might be appropriate along those lines. I'm <laughs> in the state capital, so I'm going to be lobbying. So I'm sorry if I'm going to get off the phone, but I'm going to be listening as I'm, as I'm traveling through it. So I'm sorry that I have to I'm not be a visual. Understood. No worries whatsoever. All right, uh, with that, I'm uh, very excited to introduce our speaker uh, for this morning. Um, our speaker, Mark Wilbur, president and CEO of Everything HR and the Employers Group. Uh, since joining the Employers Group in March 2007, as the youngest president and CEO in the association's 124 year history, Mark Wilbur brought an extraordinary level of innovation and leadership to transform the organization and reestablish it as the industry leader in human resources professional services. He transformed EG's HR services into industry leading everything HR with an enhanced technology infrastructure for today's HR service needs to respond to the demands of running a business in the now generation. Need it now, do it now, get it done now. So Mark sits on many current boards and has sat on many boards in the past, including currently uh, board of directors for the National Association of Manufacturers and LA County Business Federation, BizFed, fondly known as BizFed. 
and he's the former chair of BizFed. BizFed is the largest alliance of business networks in California, representing more than 350,000 businesses and over 3.5 million employees across the region. The Alliance is a member of BizFed as well, and we're very happy uh, to have BizFed involved with us. Prior to EG, Mark was a consulting partner at Anderson, developing solutions for clients across the US, Asia, and Europe. And he served as an associate dean of the Marshall School of Business at USC. And at the request of then President Stephen Sample, he restructured and repositioned the business school at USC to be a global business school, launching programs across the US, China, Japan, and Europe. He earned his BA and MBA from USC, and also interestingly served as the head coach for USC's men's ice hockey team for 19 winning, <laughs> 19 seasons, winning an unprecedented eight championships and dominating the cross town cup rivalry with UCLA, 16 out of 19 seasons. Uh oh, uh oh, I got my MBA from UCLA, <laughs> but I can appreciate that. It's very impressive, Mark. He's just a wonderful, down to earth guy. And I'm so thankful that you're with us today, Mark. We're excited to hear your insights on HR and the talent market. Take it away, Mark Wilbur. Gosh, thank you so much. It's really nice to be here. I'm very excited to be here, and, and it's a real privilege to be able to present to all, all these folks. It, it's so funny, financial services people in here, uh, it, we're all having fun these days, right? I mean, it's just like the, uh, you, you talk about, you know, watching the roulette wheel go around, you never kind of never know what's going to show up on a daily basis in the market. But um, I'm really excited to get here. Why don't I jump in and get this thing rolling? Because I've got a window of time for you folks. And I want to make sure that uh, I give, try and give some time on the back end of it for some questions. Okay. So do you want me to share my screen? Yes, please. If you will. Okay. Let's do this. Okay. And share. Okay, now the real question is, I wanna make sure I'm gonna just do a quick test to make sure that we're, there we are, okay. Looks good. Okay, we're good. Okay, so I mean, yeah, I've done this before and then it's not advancing and I'm like, they're like, hey, Mark, you know what? Uh, we're, you're talking about something and we can't see that slide. And I'm like, oh God, so I, I've had it all. You know, we've all lived through the whole Zoom, uh, the Zoom world over the last couple of years. And just when you think it can't go sideways, it does. So anyway, um, let me move this over here. Perfect. Now we can rock and roll. Okay, so employers group, yep, it's uh, 125th year in 2021. You know, it's, we've been around, you know, not too many companies have 1896 in their, uh, in their letterhead. We've been around for a very long time. It's always been employer focused. Uh, we had a subsidiary. Uh, we just renamed it uh, Everything HR to kind of fit today's world, the swipe left, swipe right world that we live in on, you know, making it clear about what you do. You know, we've, we stay in our lane. And I said that uh, earlier when I first got on is that, you know, our focus is employment law, legislation, employer compliance, operational performance. We tend to stay right in that HR lane, uh, it, except for when it comes and it takes the HR department into the uh, CFO C-suite, then we get into some operational performance then, and support HR groups. We, our, our clients run the gamut. We have, I, I listed out some of the huge ones here. You probably wonder why, uh, you know, why O'Melveny, Gibson, Dunn, all these massive national law firms well, we also support them because they have a bunch of clients that, you know, they can't even deal with the day to day because they don't, you know, their billing rates are six, seven hundred dollars an hour or more, you know, and you don't want to be calling about, you know, the basic everyday questions that we get uh, on our live helpline. Uh, so they actually refer us. It's actually how we landed the NFL. It's uh, actually how we landed Disney and, uh, uh, and AT&T. So we, we work directly with these organizations and we also work with companies that have five people and it's a flower shop. So it doesn't really matter uh, what size and people do typically find us through crisis. It's usually like if something hits the fan. Well, you can imagine COVID was about as big a situation of hitting the fan as you can get. 
I, I'll never forget, we, we did our first webinar and when after the whole shelter in place hit, we did this webinar and we put it out to our membership. And of course they sent it out. I had to instantly change our Zoom contract because we had over 1200 companies, not just people, companies sign up in the first hour that we had this uh, presentation going out because no HR department knew what to do with all these different rule changes. And it hasn't stopped. And over those two, over the two years of COVID, just to give you an idea, there's been over 2,000 rule changes that HR departments have had to deal with. Uh, everything from, you know, it's over. Oh, it's not over. Oh, we're going to do partial compliance. Oh, we're going to wear masks. Oh, we're not going to wear masks. And then you, you know, you dribble it in across the board. We all lived through it and it was exhausting. So first let's take it. I think it's important before I get into whole retention and recruiting, which was the focus of today's discussion. Uh, and I get asked to do these, these presentations around reinventing HR departments and rethinking uh, how they operate because Technically speaking, I'm not an HR person uh, at all. You know, I yeah become uh, become one over the last decade running this organization, but that's not where I cut my teeth at all. So you know, I, I tend to be a strategy person. I'm a turnaround person. Um, you know, I deal with mergers and acquisitions and things like that through my career as being a partner at Anderson and and so on. So, you know, this whole area has been uh, really, really problematic for a lot of companies, but I don't think they understand a lot of times what actually has happened and what's happening right now, because today's focus is going to be trying to think through going forward, because most people are, you thought you were exhausted dealing with COVID. That's nothing compared to what we're dealing with right now. So we're in this post-COVID new normal, if you will where you either have a virtual workforce or you have some kind of hybrid situation going on. Uh, you may have had companies or employees that haven't even bothered to come back to work. You may have had people you know, resign and go off and set up an eBay business or set up an Amazon business or, or what have you. It, it's, it's been absolutely incredible at the shift of employment and the lack of uh, energy coming back into the workforce. There are, it's, a, it's actually a record. There are over 12 million open positions that are tracked uh, through the federal government uh, available in the United States today. That's stunning. That is, we've never had that many available. And yet at the same time, uh, companies are, are, are obviously trying to hire. They have these positions out there, but nobody's coming back. So we have this underemployment issue going on that is also problematic and feeding into the same issue. Layering on that process is a state government that is trying to grapple with keeping control of their economy and trying to manage through it. it it's really a, a difficult situation because the, uh, especially with the um, AB5 that came through that wiped out the independent contractor, and, and made it very difficult to qualify as an independent contractor. Well, a lot of people had to make it uh, more clear that they're an independent contractor and set up their own business and, uh, and deal with it in that way. So that's just the post COVID new normal. Then you get into, after all that expenditures, I mean, you knew that this was gonna come to roost at some point. I mean, we spent trillions of dollars, not millions, not billions, trillions of dollars dealing with uh, the situation of COVID. Well, and that created, you know, that's whenever you have a money supply issue like that, eventually that's going to come to roost. There is no such thing as, you know, a free lunch, if you will. It's always going to come back to, to hit you at some point. And that's where we're at right now. We're dealing with the highest inflation rate in over 40 years. On top of that, we have this supply chain issue I just read an article this morning. I always try and buff up on the, you know, on the brand new issues or the headlines that are coming out before I give a, just a talk. And you know, China is doubling down this morning. You know, they are further locking down Beijing, Shanghai, and other locations across China, trying to get to a zero COVID 
uh, position, which may never happen, but that has impacted the supply chain. So first we had ships parked out in the bay and we couldn't get them offloaded. Now we can't get the ships over here because they can't go to work. Even Tesla and you know, Elon is known for his defiance uh, on a lot of levels. And even Elon can't get the Shanghai uh, operation up and running right now. Even that is uh, shuttered temporarily. So it's a big issue. It, we have a very interconnected economy with China. And so that is really hitting the supply chain issue and further going to impact inflation. If you think inflation is bad, and I know the report this morning that came out, it, it seems like there's a little bit of relief. Trust me, that's going to be very limited. You know, from my economics background, I, I think uh, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. <clears throat> so this, ex this extensive stimulus and the loss of um, uh, energy independence, you know, so again, let's get away from the politics of this whole thing because I, I don't like that kind of stuff. It gets, gets kind of messy. But we had gas issues before Ukraine even hit the gas prices and the inflation was already starting to hit us before Ukraine. But what Ukraine did was kind of turned on the Bunsen burner underneath all of it and just made it all worse. You know, driving uh, barrel oil cost uh, above $100 a barrel. Uh, and now we're also sending money. I mean, it's not stimulus money, uh, but it is money going out uh, of the United States and being spent elsewhere. Again, that's going to hurt us at the end of the day if we don't get that stuff uh, shored up. And then last but not least, the Fed has responded to this trying to put a lid on inflation with in interest rate increases. They did a half a, half a point last time. Uh, prior to that, it was a quarter. I suspect there's probably going to be a couple more half points going forward. There's even some people you know, yelling for a, a full point. You know, it might be a little extreme to do that because I think we all saw the volatility of what happens even with a half a point. So you have all of these factors hitting businesses today. And that's what we're all about, right? I mean, the whole issue is trying to deal with businesses and try and figure out a way that we're going to move forward. Well, part of what's going to happen here, I think going forward, and we're going to talk through that in a minute here, is that if we keep going with the inflation and we keep going and we hit the R word, the R word being recession, if that hits before year end, we may not have to worry about all of this unfilled positions because typically what comes with recession are layoffs. Uh, Carvana laid off 2,500 people in Phoenix yesterday. And it was not expected. It was something that just came out. So, you know, and you're only, this is the tip of the iceberg. You're going to start seeing more and more of this as uh, response of businesses try and respond to the uh, increased cost of running their business. So I'm going to focus on six critical areas in dealing with hiring with the whole recruiting and retention area. The first I'm going to focus in on a retention, and then I'll shift to re recruiting blended in with retention. So you've got to have to, you're going to have to really rethink your organizational communication. And this is really important. Okay. You got to fix retention before you start just adding more bodies, because guess what? If you haven't fixed retention and now you start going and recruiting and adding more bodies, all you're going to do is throw more people onto what is likely a bit of a mess in trying to keep your people. The HR departments can quickly tell you whether there's a retention issue in your organization or not. If you're losing people, you're bleeding people out the back door, I, I, I can trust me, it's, it's one of those situations It's not going to take its foot off the gas pedal. You're going to have to actually actively do something about it. Because right now, as I stated earlier, there's lots of positions that are open. So people have options. And as they start moving around to different positions, it creates inflation in and of itself because of the increased payroll costs and trying to hire people that you need because you're willing to throw more money at them. If you need a controller, you need a CFO, you need uh, just an accounting staff person, any of those kind of positions, the cost of those people today is much more than it was in 2019. The second area in this is another area of importance 
is trying to deal with engagement. And, you know, this is part of the taking action when it comes to rethinking the organizational communication. A lot of organizations today with the whole remote access have lost their ability to effectively communicate. Some have gotten really good at it. I mean, they've made uh, work meetings actually fun. I've, I've seen them send out packets of things that everybody cooks together. I've seen them do all sorts of creative things to try and create engagement uh, at the employee level, especially in this remote hybrid uh, world that we're in now. So if it's a manufacturing company and you know people have to come back to the, the shop floor and things like that, it's, it's less, uh, less impactful as far as redesigning organizational communication, but have no illusion you might not think you have a retention issue, but they are hearing about things other companies are doing from their friends, their neighbors, and things like that. So you need to have things in place that are being proactive in trying to create a situation that they have some loyalty and some desire to come back to the same place they've been working. Uh, we, we've had clients call us and have lost a ton of their workforce, uh, like a tsunami. You'll have you know organizations come in and just start hiring people away, and you don't want to be in that position. You want to be out in front of it as quickly as you can. The communication and how this works with people at home, you you have this other issue that starts to surface, and I refer to it as the workforce paranoia, because people see somebody get promoted. And it's, you know, maybe they're come back to the office, but this other person doesn't feel comfortable coming back yet. And so somebody else gets promoted, they don't, you get, get some jealousy issues going on, you can create a retention issue just in that. So I, if, you, if you hear nothing else today, make sure that you pause and really take a look at what are the communication channels and strategies in place? How am I connecting with my people how am I connecting with the supply chain internally of how people are getting their work done? This is super important. I can't emphasize it enough. And of all the situations that I get called into, this is typically where the issues are. They haven't properly addressed the engagement or they know about it, but they haven't done anything about it. So <clears throat> the last... The last piece of advice on this slide, don't do an employee opinion survey, don't reach out and do an engagement survey unless you're actually going to take action. You can actually create what's called disengagement by doing that. You're actually better off not asking anything and doing nothing, which would be contrary to what I'm just telling you, but that's okay, than to send out a survey asking for their feedback and then doing nothing about it. So that creates disengagement and people typically leave during disengagement. So you wanna make sure that at a minimum, if you're gonna do an employee opinion survey, you need to give the results, you need to share it, you need to openly take some action on it. And that actually makes people feel like management and leadership is going to do something about my issues, my concerns. I'm worried that you know, I, I tell them what's wrong and they're not doing anything about it. So it's really important to do that. <clears throat> so one of the things that's been really hard on HR departments, there's no, you know, when COVID, <laughs> excuse me. So during COVID, you know, I don't know about any of you, but you know, when I went to the MBA school, there wasn't a class called how to handle the pandemic. <laughs> Nobody had ever dealt with this before, you know? You talk about a clean sheet of paper. I mean, nobody had ever faced these situations. So, you know, the expectations of people in their positions have completely been thrown out the window. How do you deal with performance management? I mean, maybe we pause and, and give a moment of silence for those managers who are the hovering type of managers who have to like, see the person in their cube and have to stand over their work. Can you imagine the work anxiety those folks have? 
good Lord. <laughs> so, I mean, these are all challenges. You know, how do you deal with the job design? How do you deal with job descriptions? How do you ferret out all of the different responsibilities people have in this current situation? How do you deal with onboarding? Sure, I go out, let's put together a program. I go hire 10 people, and, but half of them are gonna be remote. Half of them are gonna be part-time in the office. How do I deal with that onboarding? How do you make it feel so it's inclusive? How do they get to meet and spend time with their work friends and their work buddies and their colleagues and so on? This has been, this is a huge issue. How do you build in flexibility into your talent management process so that you can start working towards loyalty through culture? What I love to hear is going to an organization and I love talking with middle management and uh, senior like supervisory level staff because that's where the trench warfare is going on, right? This is where you're either losing people, you're gaining people, and these people actually know what's going on. And I love hearing comments about loyalty. I just love it here. You know, they, this is what they did. These are the things that they did to make my life easier. Oh, they put a T1 line into my office at home, or they did this. Wh whatever those things are that creates that loyalty through culture, it's critical to find that because that plays like music in an organization. So you wanna make sure that the work that you did on the first slide that I shared around those areas of, you know, asking how things are going, taking some action, building effective communication channels with your uh, employees. This, these are the kinds of things that are going to drive your ability to be able to recruit. Because trust me, if you bring somebody in and they start doing remote interviews and they're interviewing with somebody who is now disengaged and unhappy, how good do you think that person is going to be during the interview process? Probably not very good. In fact, they could completely undermine your, your process. So you want to be able to get through that point where people are feeling loyal to the culture and feel proud of the things that the organization has done to get through COVID and are now standing on their own two feet um, on the other side of COVID. These are, these are, I know they sound, you know, Mamby Pamby, maybe, you know, hold hand, sing kumbaya stuff. But the truth is, this is the kind of stuff that will make the difference in recruiting. And I'm, I'm sure the recruiters that I heard that are um, in this meeting today uh, will emphasize this as well, because doing recruiting, especially when you're doing interviews via Zoom and those kinds of things, it's hard to hide somebody's engagement if they're really disengaged or they're not interested that's gonna come across to candidates in, in a hot second. So now let's start shifting a little bit from retention into the recruiting and actively taking a look at the organization. Again, recruiters, I love recruiters because they're, they're on the front lines of trying to find the best and the brightest for your organization. They do great work. Uh, and you know the days of just you know, posting an Indeed you know, ad, it may sound nice and it's really inexpensive to do that, but boy, you're gonna have to farm through a whole bunch of garbage to get through to the people you really want and need in your organization. So, you know, yeah, it's fine for, you know, maybe early on staff and things like that, but when you're into positions that are making decisions and part of management, sometimes you really, um, you know, really need to lean on a recruiter in the process. They can also help you uh, deal with some of the liability issues because they take on some of that through their interview tactics and processes. So employment law, compliance, management, this is an area where people can really get themselves into trouble in their doing the interviewing and you're, you know, asking candidates because, you know, the candidates are going to be looking for flexibility. And, and part of the flexibility comes in and you can't ask certain questions. There's a lot of questions you can't ask in an interview, but when somebody's asking for flexibility, it may be because you know they need that for their children. They need that uh, for you know because a lot of the uh, daycare stuff still hasn't been brought back to the fold, and it's creating massive issues in trying to get people back into work. So you know this has really become a um, a challenge, if you will. So these laws and regulations impacting, 
you know, what you can say, what you can't say, what you can ask, what you can't ask are very important. And in Zoom, you can't hide it. It's really difficult to hide, you know, mistakes that people make in Zoom. So you want to make sure that if people are doing recruiting and they're doing it via Zoom, make sure that they've gone through some level of training and understanding about the things you can ask, the things you can't ask. When somebody's sitting in front of you and it's a casual conversation, oftentimes some of that stuff gets a little lost. And even if you do make a mistake in there, sometimes it doesn't come out because maybe you've you know, connected with the person on a, on a personal level and so it's, it doesn't seem to be driving as many issues as Zoom does, because Zoom gets into basically hard tactics of what do you have? This is what I'm asking you about. Are your availability? And you're right into the weeds of asking questions that some of which you got to be careful of in the state, especially in the state of California, because our, our state is so easy to work in, right? So I can't see all of you, so I'm assuming you're all nodding. <laughs> so, okay, so let's get into the, the rest of this here. And because there's safety issues, imagine this, if you're trying to hire a, G, uh, a GNC person or a, um, you know, some type of mechanic or some type of person in a shop floor, and that person can't actually see, it's very difficult. Now, I have actually seen people use body cameras to do part of the interview to try and show what the shop floor is like before bringing somebody in. I think we have less of that today uh, than we did during uh, shelter in place and all of that fun, but these are still issues and trying to comply with safety issues is a big deal these days. Uh, the state of California, the, you know, the um, uh, OSHA and all those folks, there's no sense of humor in this area. You've got to make sure a lot of HR people are white collar employees. They sit in a cube or an office, they're in the headquarters and they don't know what it is all about and going down there. And it's hard for them to make an assessment of it. So make sure that if there are any kinds of positions uh, that are gonna require some level of safety, make sure you have an understanding of what it is so that you can talk intelligently about it. Don't just, you know, pass it off or brush it off. It's very important to understand that. The best recruiters will actually come out and spend time at the offices and in some of the operations so they can give a, a better feel for a candidate as to what it's like to work there. Then you get into these, these areas around uh, the OFCCP. So the OFCCP doubled in size. Now the OFCCP is the, are the, is the folks that uh, manage the affirmative action plans that get done. So if you have a federal contract and there are a ton of businesses in the Valley that have federal contracting, a ton. And if you're a subcontractor feeding into a prime that's with the federal contract, you too are required to file uh, an affirmative action plan. But they're not just doing that. They've doubled the number of OFCCP uh, staff. Uh, and they've increased audits during this time frame, And now they're starting to do an overlay around issues like pay equity and, and what are your hiring practices and all of these areas. If you use a recruiter in this process, you need to make sure they're engaged in it so they understand it, uh, understand it better. Uh, and then, you know, this also gets into the differing jurisdictions. Some of the issues, I mean, I understand the OFCCP is a federal issue and it cuts across that, but in some of the uh, local areas, the amount of auditing or non-auditing that goes on can have an, also an impact as to how you approach that, that area. So this is, this is a big deal. We work, with, we work with affirmative action plans all the time. We actually do plans all the time. And it's, it's, a, it's an area that has some challenges to it because most people think, oh, you know, I'm paying, you know, John more than Sally, but Sally may have gotten that job uh, when there was a plethora of job openings and I didn't have to pay top dollar to fill that position. That happens as much as people don't like talk about it. The economic issues that ebb and flow in the hiring world have a huge impact on, on what you're paying people. 
So you, you can actually defend yourself in an OFCCP audit related to this uh, based on timeframes, based on imprint. That's why you keep records about, you know, your hiring and your, uh, your pay practices. So these are some big issues that people are dealing with today uh, around affirmative action plans. This administration has really tried to put some teeth into this area. So if you're in non-compliance, I really highly suggest you get uh, out in front of that. How am I doing on time, Sonia? Am I doing all right? Oh, thanks, Mark. I think we have about one more minute, and then we will do question and answers in okay. the chat. So we're That's perfect. We're, we're, we're there. I'll blow through the next slide pretty quickly. Yeah, all, you'll all get this uh, going forward. So um, comp and benefits area. You know, this is an area where, you know, the, it changes, it's just changing today, you know, what you're providing. For a lot of people, the millennials, as you refer to them, or the Gen Zs and all of this, it's sometimes not about the money. It's about the flexibility. It's about the, uh, the situations they're going to be in and reporting and, and how their whole life structure is going to be impacted related to uh, whether they're interested in the position or not. Uh, the employee expectations may be on a completely different plane than yours. That's why doing an employee opinion survey is good, but hopefully all of you just went in the back of your mind and said, okay, but if I do that, I got to make sure I take action because I talked about that earlier and that's really critical. Don't ask if you're not going to do anything. <clears throat> Incentives have changed today. Uh, how do you, you know, deal with promotion criteria when you haven't seen the person in a year and a half and yet they're doing extraordinary work? How do you put together an org chart with a hybrid situation? Okay, you may not know how to do that, but the expectations of the employees is that you not only know how to do that, but you've already done it and you're out in front of it. They're expecting you to be on top of these leadership areas around understanding the organization. If they can't communicate and they can't get their job done effectively, they're expecting you to fix it. And I mean, fix it now because they're sitting at home. They already have the remote paranoia going because they think they're going to get passed over for something or they're going to miss out on working on the important things. Somehow I'm not going to connect with my boss anymore to get promoted. There's a lot of paranoia that goes on in this and it can actually be a trigger for lawsuits uh, just to be, to be honest about it. So how you do these offer packages and how you put out in front of them leadership development and how they get connected into the org chart and who they're communicating with and who they're being run by is really important. And then the last thing will be into Q&A, the corporate culture, and I mentioned this earlier, you want to be working towards creating a culture that creates loyalty. If I have everybody coming to the office, it's easy to do that. You know, donuts on Friday, you know, parking lot parties, you know, all that kind of stuff that you can do to create a fun and workable situation. You know, I went out in the Team Disney administration building during COVID and you could have hit a golf ball down through this area and yet they found a way to communicate and uh, keep their culture because they're very proud of their culture that they've developed at the organization. You know, it's a, it's a highly uh, engaged uh, environment to work there, but it's also a tough environment uh, as well. It's not like a piece of cake. It's not a walk down Main Street, if you will. So your cultural awareness and what's happening in the organization is really important. HR departments can be so critical in this, in this space to surface issues to work on a communication plan, especially the ad hoc communications. Because there's no, if I'm, if I'm in the office and I have an issue about communication, I can walk next door, I can walk down the hallway and resolve it in a minute, right? But if I'm sitting at home and I'm not getting invited and then I hear about a Zoom meeting that occurred that I wasn't invited to, what does that mean? You don't want me part of the team anymore? How, why, why was I excluded? And it could be a nothing, but you have to respond to those communication issues immediately, because if you don't, you'll end up losing these people. It's absolutely critical. So 
diversity, inclusion, equity, you know, perceived versus actual fairness. These are all things that uh, we've talked about, but have no illusion that rumor mill, the communication going behind the scenes is probably going at two to three times the speed of light compared to what goes on in an office where we take for granted that I can get up and walk next door and communicate with somebody. So that environment we sort of take for granted, but you don't have that when you have the Zoom or any kind of a hybrid situation going on. So those are my you know, six critical areas to focus on now to if you want to improve your, improve your recruiting and retention. If you do use a recruiter, um, engage them more than just a phone call. Hey, I'm looking for an XYZ. Uh, engage them and, it, and they need to make that engagement as well. So I, I put that on the recruiters as well. They've, they've got to want to do that because the better they understand their clients, the better the candidates are gonna be that they're gonna be able to provide. So that's it. Um, by the way, if you ever have a company or anything, use CEO 25, it gets you a lot of money off of membership uh, for the HR work that we do. And I'm happy to uh, happy to be here. So any questions? Whew. <laughs> Wonderful, Mark. Well, thank you for that. Really great information about retention and recruiting employees. So appreciate that. I would love to um, ask you, Mark, if you would um, just look at the chat. We've got questions in the chat. And if you might, wouldn't mind fielding those, we'd love to get your yep. expertise there while we continue with the um, agenda for the committee to talk no about. No problem. I'm going to stop the sharing. Let me jump in here and get myself caught up. Oh, you're good. You're good. You're, you're doing great. Thank you so much, Mark. This is really important uh, conversation to have. And Mark gave us some incredible tips for uh, what we really need to be aware of in the completely changing a new environment. Uh, one of the things that the Alliance is moving into next is our strategic goals for how we can help the whole region to develop our tape, uh, our talent pool. And Dr. Gribbins, did you wanna uh, set up any uh, comments about our strategic plan? And then I can run people through the goals real quick, if you'd like. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so while you're, while you're pulling up the strategic goals, just a couple of comments. Uh, I think it is incredibly helpful to uh, put together and have this framework to help guide us for the next uh, three years. I do think that the uh, the goals that have been identified really are going to help us uh, make sure that we're thinking about the activity that we need to be doing to keep the local economy healthy and supporting our local businesses. Uh, it'd be great to hear any feedback that folks have. And uh, Sonia, do you want to walk through or would you like me to walk through them? And then how do you want me to handle the Q&A that's coming in? And be sure and put questions in here if you're interested in me responding to it. I've got a couple right now. Oh, certainly, certainly, Mark, if you wouldn't mind typing your answers back. Uh, to okay, oh, you want me just to type them back? I can do that, okay. That'd be Not amazing, a... yes. You have such great expertise, we'd love that. And Dr. Gibbons, if you wouldn't mind sharing the goals in maybe just a couple of minutes, and then I can throw up a poll to ask folks if they think we're heading in the right direction. Terrific, so we do have nine goals. Uh, the first one, is the business assistance program. Of course, this is a, a central part of our work uh, and you can uh, see a few different elements to it, educational webinars, one-on-one -on -one advising, uh, et cetera. So terrific. The second one, business retention and growth. I know that uh, many of us just got some additional ideas from Mark on uh, related to business retention, but this would be uh, creating some perhaps uh, red teams to uh, provide some help uh, to local companies. The third one, talent recruitment and development. And this one I think uh, best ties to this committee, Educational and Workforce Committee, uh, helping to make sure that we have a, a really strong uh, group of folks that are um, uh, serving as the uh, talent pool. Next one, uh, Valley Main Street and Neighborhoods Recruitment of Developers, develop a, a vacant parcels, underutilized buildings. Uh, I know there's a lot of shifting going on, especially right now with the moving on to a post-pandemic world. A lot of uh, brick and mortar places have changed. Uh, the next uh, few, uh, next couple relate to fundraising. Of course, making sure that we have a, a lot of uh, uh, opportunities to generate additional revenue for the organization, for the Valley Economic Alliances is important. And I think that there's a, 
uh, many here that have uh, identified some great opportunities for people to participate. Housing campaign, uh, this is of course getting more and more attention with uh, affordability issues. And we had a great presentation uh, from LA Unified that uh, really uh, put a nice light to that, um, that issue. Business attraction, uh, so uh, Tech Valley, helping to recruit uh, uh, critical industries, companies and in critical industries to the area. And then lastly, promote visits uh, to and uh, shopping in the Valley. And with that, uh, Sonia, I think that you said you were going to uh, perhaps put up a poll. There we go. And yes. uh, for folks to indicate if we're on the right track. Yes, so, so we'd like to in, uh, encourage our committee members and guests share, you know, as the uh, those particular goals that Dr. Gribbins ran through, especially the one, uh, the ones that relate to the heart and soul of our programs. Do you think that we're heading in the right direction? Are these the right goals? If not, then please put in the chat your suggestions for what we should be focusing on as an alliance. And we'll give a couple of seconds here for people to go ahead and participate. Most everyone has participated in the poll so far, but we'll give it a couple of seconds. Three, two, one, get your votes in now. And we're gonna go ahead and throw up the results of the poll. Happy to report we're heading in the right direction in terms of the, uh, the, the goals that we're, uh, that we're pursuing. Uh, next, um, let's talk about the, uh, the goal related specifically to education and workforce development, developing the local talent pool. Uh, share with us uh, some of the strategies uh, for developing local talent. Um, so today we heard a lot of conversation about what individual businesses can do uh, with regard to developing their internal um, talent and retaining talent. When we look overall at the region, what can we do as a region, as a community uh, of, of businesses and uh, employers and others to develop our local talent pool? And I'm gonna give it a couple more seconds for people to uh, respond. Uh, and great. So here's what people are saying. Career training is by far uh, where we should be focusing our efforts. Uh, followed closely by internships and apprenticeship and employer recruitment assistance. So this is very helpful. We thank everyone for that uh, super helpful information and in your take on it, which will help shape the Alliance's uh, strategic planning going forward. Thank you all so much and thank you, Dr. Gribbins. And then finally, I know we're super short on time. Uh, lastly, um, we'd love to have um, Donna Ferruja, if you could maybe uh, share a little bit about just some additional information we have for people to know about tax credits to help them to defray the cost of developing their labor pool. Donna, did you have something to share with us? Yeah, just really quickly, I know we're short on time, but I just wanna thank Mark for such a great presentation. Um, that was awesome. Um, in the agenda, we provided two resources um, that for you or for you to share um, there to help understand the um, how to claim the business tax credits. And there are so many um, business tax credits that are available to businesses um, for you to take advantage of and the difference between like your your deductions and your credits or these tax credits reduce your tax bill on a dollar for dollar basis and so there are two attachments the first one is a guide and that guide really helps to um, explain how these tax credits work and then they list many of the credits um, and some of the, the most important ones are the new ones that are available. For instance, um, there's a credit for small business health insurance premiums. So um, if you provide health insurance for your employees and you meet certain criteria, um, you know, you could claim this credit. Um, there's another credit for the work opportunity credit. That's a popular one, one of my favorites. It um, incents companies um, with a credit to hire employees um, from underserved populations like, you know, veterans and um, people who have been unemployed for a long time. 
Um, there's another credit, again, one of my favorites is the uh, disabled access credit. So you get you can claim a credit if you make sure that your business location um, creates easy access for people with disabilities. So they, you know, there's a list of all these credits. It's really important. And that's um, in the first attachment that we have on the agenda. The second attachment um, is uh, a handout that um, explains um, how to use these credits if you qualify and gives you a list of um, the forms. Because for every one of these credits, it's not easy. You have to get the form. You have to fill out the form. So the second handout gives you a very simple guide to those forms and gives you quick access to those forms. Um, and it, it helps you understand if you're eligible to claim this this year or last year or next year, you know, carry back, carry forward, all of this is complicated, but take it to your accountants. Um, and, uh, but it's, I think it's really informative. So we thought it'd be a good resource for everyone to have. Thank you, Donna. Very, very helpful, super helpful. Um, I know we're over time, so I just wanted to thank everyone for participating. There's a lot of great information in the chat. Um, Donna and very wonderful. And Mark, thank you for your incredibly informative presentation and for enabling us, allowing us to post that on our website. I put the link where the presentation will be posted after today's session. Uh, thank you all for what you're doing. Do keep in touch with us at the Alliance um, to uh, continue this wonderful work together. And I pass it back to you, uh, Barry, if you'd like to adjourn the meeting at this time. Yeah, thank you. Just echoing the thanks and appreciation uh, to Mark, to Donna, to Sonia, and Fred for your leadership. And a special thanks for our guests. And I hope that you all come back uh, to join our next meeting. With that, uh, let us adjourn. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Mark. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Mark. Talk soon. Bye bye.